Bonjour. That's where the French stops. <laughs> okay, so quick show of hands. Who was in my presentation yesterday? Okay, good. Not everybody. Um, the first couple of slides, there will be a little bit of overlap between what I presented yesterday and what I'm going to talk about today. So, um, obviously, for those of you who weren't there, that's new stuff. For those of you who were in my presentation yesterday, it's a little bit of revision. Now, I changed the title of this slightly from the one that was advertised, because when I submitted this, it was JDK 9. And now, with the new, faster release cadence for the JDK, it's JDK 10. So, I said, Right, we'll do JDK 9 and JDK 10, pitfalls for the unwary. And the idea of this is to talk about all the things which have changed between JDK 8, which I assume most people are using, and JDK 9 or JDK 10. Because JDK 10 is a superset of JDK 9, all of the things, if you're going to move to JDK 9, all of the things that I'm going to talk about with JDK 9 are still applicable when you move your application. JDK 9, there were a lot of changes. So there was like over 100 things that were added to JDK 9 and things that got changed. But the key thing about JDK 9, other than modularity, which we're going to talk about in a moment, is that it was a big shift in terms of Oracle's approach to how to deliver Java. What I mean by that is that in the past, we've had 23 years of development of Java. And over those 23 years, more and more things have been added to Java. So we've had more APIs, we've had more classes, more methods, more features, more command line options, more bits and pieces that have been added to the JDK. Great. But really, nothing has been deleted in that time. And JDK 9 the developers finally said, right, enough is enough. You know, we've had 23 years of development. There are things which were added you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, that we really need to tidy up. And we need to remove these things from the JDK. So JDK 9 is a bit different because it does actually remove things as well as adding things. And that's a trend which is going to continue. So we'll talk about JDK 10. There's a number of things that have been removed from JDK 10. JDK 11 has already announced that certain things are being removed as well. So that's kind of the, the big difference from a sort of development perspective. When it comes to JDK 9, there is a, you know, how do you migrate your applications? And the guidance from Oracle, this is a quote from Oracle's product management, clean applications that just depend on Java SE should just work. And, you know, it's it's a little less than reassuring when it says should rather than will. You know, I, I like a nice definitive will, but it's should just work. And we will see over the next few slides why it is that you need to be aware of various changes which could impact on the ability to run your applications. So let's start with the big thing in JDK 9, which is the module system. So the module system is going to have an impact on applications. Now, the idea behind the module system was to take rt.jar. rt.jar is our standard class libraries. And again, because it's 23 years of development, if you go back to JDK 1.0, you will find that there are about 200 classes in there. Great. Over time, more and more things have been added, more and more features. So the wonderful thing is we don't have to create our own list class, we don't have to create our own semaphore class, and so on. But it means that JDK 8 has about 4,500 classes in RT.jar. And no application that anybody could think of is going to use all 4,500 of those classes. The idea then with modularity was to say, OK, let's take that RT.jar, this big monolithic library, and break it up into pieces which are logical. So we'll have one for the desktop, we'll have one for util, we'll have one for the base classes, and so on. And make it such that we can have individual modules, and then when we want to deploy an application, potentially in sort of a microservices architecture, rather than having to ship this whole rt.jar file, which is you know, tens of megabytes in size, let's only ship the modules that we need for the application code you're going to run. 
This has numerous advantages, not just from a size perspective, but also in terms of limiting security attack surfaces, in terms of performance because of the way that the class path works and so on. So there's a number of good reasons for separating RT.jar into a set of modules. And what we've ended up with in JDK 9 and subsequently JDK 10 is 97 modules in the JDK. Now of those, there are 28 which are defined by the Java SE standard. These are the ones that are in the JSR. If you look at the, the list of libraries, you'll find those are the ones which make up 28 modules in the JDK. Then there's a whole set of other ones. There's uh, eight for JavaFX, there's two which are Oracle specific, and then there's a whole group which are JDK specific. Key thing here is no more rt.jar, no more tools.jar. So that's one thing you need to be aware of already. If you were writing an application that was going to use those files directly, maybe something you're doing that would do that, then they're no longer there. So you need to be thinking about how to change that. The other key thing is the idea of encapsulating internal APIs. And this was something where if you look at rt.jar, there's 4,500 classes, which are the ones that you're in encouraged to use. These are the public APIs. But there's also a lot of APIs in there which are non-public. They're the ones that are put there to make the public ones work. And right from the very beginning, Sun and then Oracle have been very clear about this, that you're not encouraged to use them. You know, they don't say you absolutely positively can't. There's nothing wrong with it. But they've said you know, they're not supported in the sense of they're not documented. They're not intended for general developer use, and so on. And potentially, they could be removed at any point without any warning. So what Oracle wanted to do was to encapsulate all of these and take them away from you. Great. Problem was that a lot of people have used them. So quick show of hands. Who here has used Sun Misc Unsafe? OK, yeah, fair, fair number of hands. Who here uses a third-party library or a framework in their application? OK, yes, so you probably have used Sun Misc Unsafe. You just don't know about it. And if Oracle had encapsulated these internal APIs, the problem was it's going to break a lot of code, because there's a lot of libraries out there that have used it. And if people suddenly found that those libraries didn't work, it was going to be very difficult for Java applications. And especially with things like Sun Misc Unsafe, there's no easy equivalent. So it's not like um, UUD code and UUN code, which are other examples of internal APIs that people have used, where there's now a public version of that. So they decided that they weren't going to actually encapsulate them um, hard encapsulate them, and we'll talk in a moment about how to get access to these APIs if you need them. So the other thing was the use of the module path. So now we, have a, we had a class path where we put our jar files. Now we have a module path where we locate the modules that we need. And so separate, distinct from the class path. If we want to migrate applications to the module system, what do we do? So if we've got a JDK 8 application and we want to move it to JDK 9 and use the modules, how do we do that? Well, the simplest thing to do is ignore the module system. So at the moment, everything you have is a set of jar files. You put it on the class path, and you set your runtime up that way. You can do that in JDK 9. So just leave everything on the class path. And anything on the class path is treated as part of the unnamed module. So there's this big unnamed module, which is everything on the class path. All of the packages that you have in your jar files will be exported to all of the other modules, so they'll be visible to all of the other modules on the module path. And the unnamed module has a dependency on all the modules on the module path. So because you can't specify anything, um, it just does the defaults to make sure that everything will work. So if you've got an application, you can just move it to JDK 9. And so long as you haven't used any internal APIs, then it should just work. Should. If you want to then migrate to the module system, you can do it in two stages. So the first thing you can do is you can take your jar files and move them from the class path to the module path. If you don't make any changes to your jar file, so if you don't include the module info.class file, then these will be treated as automatic modules. Automatic modules are just plain jar files. And the name of the module will be the name of the jar file. 
all of the public packages in there will be exported to the other modules and visible to the other modules on the module path, and all of the other modules on the module path will be visible to the, the module that you put there, the automatic module. So you could do that without having to make any changes to your jar file. If you then want to take the next step, you can actually modularize your application properly. You can create your module info.java file, you can compile it, put it into the jar file, and then make it into a proper module. That allows you to extend the use of the module system so you can specify exact dependencies, you can limit which packages in your jar file are visible to other modules, and so on. So you can do it in a, in a staged way. Now, in terms of overriding encapsulation, this is the important thing, because obviously the goal was to just encapsulate all internal APIs. That wasn't going to work, so Oracle came up with this wonderfully named Big Kill Switch. So there's a command line option, which is illegal access. It's great, isn't it? Illegal access. And there are four options that you can specify with illegal access. The first, which is the default at the moment, is permit. So that will allow you to bypass the encapsulation of the internal APIs. If you use an internal API, then the first time that you use it, you will get a warning message telling you that you've used an internal API. Great. If you need more information, you can turn things up to the next level, and you can set the flag with illegal access to be warn. And that will give you a warning every time you use an internal API, not just the first time, but every time you use it. Then if you want even more information, you can turn it up to debug, and debug will give you a warning every time you use an internal API, and it will give you a stack trace so that you can find out where your code called this internal API from. So if you want to make changes, you can then track it back and change whatever needs to be changed. Fourth option is deny, and that's where it turns off the ability to circumvent encapsulation. So in effect, it turns on encapsulation. And that, at some point, will become the default. Now, it's not clear when that's going to happen. It's not going to be in JDK 10. Don't believe it's going to be in JDK 11. Who knows when it will actually become the default. So at the moment, you can still get around the ideas of encapsulation. That's a sort of global way of doing it. You can also do things in a more controlled way. So there are a couple of other command line options that you can use if you need to get access to the internal APIs, and you don't want to just give blanket access to your application code. So if you need to import specific packages from the internal APIs, then you can do add exports. And a couple of examples here. So in the case of the Java management module, we might want to import um, the JMX remote internal package. But we can limit that to only my test module. So only the my test module will have access to this. If we want to grant access to all of the things on the class path, then we can do that in the case of the Sun management package by saying all unnamed. So we've got a very fine-grained way of doing this, either to specific modules or to everything on the class path. The other way that people tend to access these internal APIs is through reflection. So rather than importing the packages, they use reflection to gain access. And there's a separate command line option that allows you to do that. So you can do add opens. And again, with the example here in the case of the Java base module, we might want to grant reflective access to the Java util package or packages. And then again, we can say all unnamed, which means the class path will have reflective access to all of the things in Java util. We can even do that rather than on the command line, we can actually specify it in the jar file manifest. So there's, again, simpler ways or, or different ways of enabling you to override the, the necessary things. So if you wanted to create a, a library which you want to provide to people and you didn't want them to have to put certain things on their command line, then you can specify in the jar file manifest and you can say add exports uh, in the case of the security provider in the Java base module, then that would be accessible. How do you find where you've used encapsulated APIs? Well, there's a nice tool that's been included now, which is called JDEPS. JDEPS analyzes the dependencies that you have in a particular jar file on certain APIs. 
And so I thought, well, okay, let's take an example here. And uh, you know, Minecraft. Minecraft's a you know jar file, so it's quite a big jar file. Let's run JDEPs on that. And if you do things like list dependencies. Um, what you get is something like this. So it tells you the modules that you're, de you're depending on. You can get much more complex and long uh, output from it. So if you're interested in specific APIs and, and looking at the internal APIs and so on, then you can do that. But if you just do list dependencies, it'll tell you what the modules are that you need to have in order to make this thing run. So if I, I did uh, the jar file and it got, gave me java.base, which obviously it should have because that's the, uh, the module that everything has to have in it. Data transfer, desktop, management, naming, great. All of those things logical. And then it got not found. Now, this doesn't strike me as being a very useful part of the output, because what does it not? What did it not find? Um, I did a bit of research on this, and it seems that what I had, to, what I should have done, is actually specified th other things on the class path. So it, it gets a bit confused if you don't have all the other jar files that you need on the class path. But I do find that this is a little bit irritating because that's not a very good error message. It should be better than that in terms of saying what was not found or you know, why is it not found something. So JDEPS is good, but you know, could be a little bit better. Next thing, missing modules. So remember the, the, the uh, quote from Oracle's product management, clean applications that only use Java SE. Now, they were very explicit in what they said here, Java dot SE. Java.se is one of the modules in the JDK. And in fact, it's a meta module, which means it doesn't contain any packages itself. It only references other modules. So Java.se is all of the, funny enough, Java SE modules, the 28 modules that you need for the standard. There's another module, meta module, which is called Java.se.ee. A little bit confusing in terms of the naming, but what that is, is the enterprise side of things, enterprise Java APIs that have gradually been added to the Java JDK over time. And the decision has been made that this is going to be phased out from the JDK. So at the moment, in JDK 9, and obviously JDK 10, these uh, java.se.ee modules will not be included by default. And that means if you compile code against JDK 9, if you run code against JDK 9, if you've used anything from these particular modules, your code will not compile properly and it will not run properly. So you will get error messages to say that these things can't be resolved. The modules that are actually affected are Corba. Anybody using Corba? OK, well, that means that's not a problem then, is it? Um, OK, so Corba is one of those things which is very old. Nobody's really writing Corba. Well, I don't think anybody's writing Corba code anymore. Um, then there's other things. There's transaction, there's activation. And then there's a group of modules which are related to web services. So these are XML.bind, XML web services, web service annotation. And you might think, oh, well, web services still being used. But uh, these are specifically around the SOAP way of doing web services rather than the... Uh, um, you know, the more conventional way of uh, RESTful web services. So anybody doing, you know, SOAP-based web services? Okay. Well, oh, a couple. Okay. So there's going to be a few people that are going to have to make some changes. Um, okay. So these things, by default, will not be included. So if you want to compile against them, you have to do some other things. Um, if you want to run against them, you have to do some other things. From JDK 11, these are all going to be removed. So they're not going to be in the JDK at all in JDK 11. If you want to use these modules, so for those of you who are still doing SOAP-based web services, then there are some command lines that you can, command line options that you can use to enable you to get access to these. So add modules will allow you to do that. So if you wanted to add Corba to that, you can say add modules Java Corba. You can also set up various other ways that you can gain access to them. Um, there are um, modules available from Maven Central. Um, the relevant JSR, with the exception of Corba, have standalone versions. So you can actually gain access to the module for that, and then you can put them onto your upgrade module path um, using the relevant command line option and then where the <coughs> module is actually found from. So there's various different ways you can, you can still do that in, uh, well, JDK 9, JDK 10 is easy. In JDK 11, you will have to provide those modules separately from the JDK. Small incompatibilities. 
So these are the, the little things. So the, rather than the sort of bigger thing of more generality, what are the smaller things that might catch you out in terms of JDK 9? Well, the first of those is that a single underscore is now a keyword in Java. Anybody use a single underscore as a variable name? OK. Uh, one. OK. Well, the good news is that you can still use two or more underscores as a variable name, and that will work. But a single underscore will generate this error message. So you'll, you'll say, as a release line, underscore is a keyword and may not be used as an identifier. The reason for that is that in JDK 11, possibly 12, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure when it is, um, there's, uh, they're going to use a single underscore in Lambda expressions so that you can um, use a single underscore as a parameter for a Lambda expression if the parameter is not used in the body of the Lambda expression. So that's one thing that might catch you out. As I said, there are a number of things which were deprecated in the past, and now finally, some of these things are being removed because you know, there's literally hundreds of classes, methods, and other elements that have been deprecated since JDK 1.0, and none of them up until JDK 9 have actually been removed. So in JDK 9, there are three classes, each of which have two methods. Add property change listener, remove property change listener, and they have been removed. So six methods in total. And you have to look at that and you have to think to yourself, well, what did these six methods do that was so bad that they were selected as the only six methods that were going to be deleted from JDK 9? And the answer to that is really to do with modularization. Because when you take the rt.jar file and you try and break it up into these modules, what you find is there are some very weird relationships where people have used odd methods from other parts of the JDK in order to implement different things. And so in order to have a cleaner separation of the modules in the JDK, they needed to remove these six APIs. So that's the reason why they chose those six rather than any other ones that have been deprecated. One class was deprecated. So these are the things that you need to be aware of. If you've used those property change listeners in those particular classes, same thing here, there's a class which is com sun security auth callback dialog callback handler. Anybody use that one? No. Oh, <laughs> unbelievable. That's the first person I found that's actually used that particular API. <laughs> well, in JDK 9, it has been removed. So it was deprecated in JDK 7, so that there's been a reasonable amount of warning for that. And so we need, uh, if you've been using that, then you'll have to make some changes to your code. Again, there is a way of enabling you to find where you're using deprecated APIs. So there's a command called jdeprescan. Uh, it's new in JDK 9. And what it'll do is it will take jar file or class file, and it'll do a static analysis on it. It'll look at all the methods that are being used, all the elements that are being used, and it will give you a report of what has been used that has been deprecated. So I just kind of wrote a simple example here, and I said, OK, jdeprescan on an example class that has various things in it, and it gives you information about, you know, so the security, uh, RMI security manager is deprecated, there's get selected values as a method that's been deprecated, and, and so on. So there's various things, and it will give you the information about what you're using that has been deprecated. That way you can, you can start looking at your code and figuring out, okay, do I need to make some changes to this um, in terms of moving forward? One of the other things that was done in JDK 9 was the structure of the JDK itself was changed. And the reason I'm telling you about this is because if you have written um, you know, an application where you rely on the structure of the JDK and you rely on certain files being in certain places, you may need to make changes. What we had before JDK 9 was the idea of a separate JDK and Java runtime environment. So the JDK would have a bin directory, and that would have Java C, it would have Java H, it would have a copy of Java, the binary executable. Then you'd have a lib directory that would have tools.jar in it. Then there would be a separate JRE directory. Within the JRE directory, there would be a bin directory. Bin directory would have Java in it. So you actually got two copies of Java for the price of one. And then the lib directory would have rt.jar in it, and so on. Really, the idea of that was to, to enable people to deploy a runtime separate from the JDK if they wanted to. In JDK 9, that's been sort of tidied up. So now we have a flat directory structure. 
We only have one bin directory, so only one copy of the Java executable. We have a conf directory where all the uh, configuration files that you might want to change are going to be located. Most people don't bother changing the configuration of the JDK. It's things like some font stuff. Uh, I think there's some sound configuration, things like that. Lib directory for native libraries and jmods is where the module files, which used to be rt.jar, are now located. So the important thing to be aware of is that there is no more jre directory, there's no more tools.jar, and there's no more rt.jar. Version string format. So again, if you've written a piece of code where you've relied on the version string format for the JDK, if you're developing some sort of tool, then you will need to change your code. Now, this is, this is one of those things where um, things get very confusing with Java sometimes, and the version string format is one of those things. Because if you trace back through history, you know we've literally had a new version string format almost for every version of Java that we've had. I wrote a blog entry on that because it was quite entertaining. For example, if you download Java SE 8 update 131 and you then do Java minus version, the version is actually 1.8.0 underscore 131. This is where sort of marketing and engineering clash because you, know, you get the problem of like engineering want one thing, marketing want another, and so it gets a bit confusing. Similarly, we have situations like you could have JDK 7 update 55, JDK 7 update 60. Now, which of those would you expect to have more patches in? Well, logically, it would be 60, wouldn't it? Because that comes after 55. No, 55 actually has more patches in it than 60. So there are situations where these, this gets very confusing. To ideally eliminate all of this confusion, we now have the new, new, improved version string format, because we went through, I think, three different versions in order to get to JDK 10. No, yeah, 10. Um, three different versions. So now we have feature, interim, update, and patch, which is good, because feature is going to be the big number, so 10, 11, 12. Interim is going to be, well, zero, always going to be zero, um, unless in some point in the future they need that and they decide to use it for something else. Update will be one, two, three very logical, and patch will be used if they have to issue an emergency patch between, oh dear, um, <laughs> the emergency patch if they have to um, one between the scheduled updates. So the idea of this is easier to understand, much more semantic in its approach, um, and so your code should be able to make use of that. Non-programmatic things that you might need to be aware of in terms of using the JDK. Java Network Launch Protocol. Um, this is used by Java WebStart. Anybody using Java WebStart? Okay, a few people. So the, the JNLP, um, now in JDK 9, they're using strict parsing of the configuration file. So if you are using WebStart, if your JNLP file is not quite um, fully conforming to the standard, in the past, it would still have been parsed, but now it's, it's fully strict parsing, so you might have to make some changes to your configuration file. The extension mechanism and the endorsed standards override mechanisms, which were used in the past for allowing you to include additional JAR files, um, the, these tended to get used by things like app servers and things like that. Because of the module system, these have gone away. And so the directories that this affect are, there's the ext directory in Java Home Lib, and the endorsed directory. Um, often the ext directory, you use it for putting um, native libraries in there if you're doing something like JNI. So I know I've done that before. Problem is now, if you create an ext directory in your JDK, and you put something in it, and you try and run your application, what you're going to find is you get lib ext exists. Extensions mechanism no longer supported. Use minus class path instead. Um, and it won't actually allow your JDK to, or JVM to start up. So there's some things that you need to be aware of there if you want to use that. GC options. A lot of GC options in JDK 8 were deprecated. And the idea was this sort of tidying up and removing some of the things that people at Oracle didn't really want to support anymore. 
So a number of these that were deprecated are now been removed. So if you were using them before on JDK 8, you got a, we would have got a warning. Now they won't actually work. So there's, there's various things. Uh, primarily, it's things like incremental concurrent mark sweep has gone away. There's also some odd options where if you were using the parallel new and serial old, that won't work together. Not sure why you would have done parallel new and serial old, but uh, those things are going away. A couple of things that were introduced in JDK 9 were the idea of unified JVM logging. So in the past, all the different aspects of the JVM, in terms of logging messages for garbage collection, for thread handling, for um, various different aspects, would be logged by different subsystems. Now in JDK 9, we've got a unified logging system. And related to that, obviously, GC logging, which a lot of people do use, uses the U new unified logging system. The important part about that is that there are a lot of changes in terms of command line flags. So these command line flags have all been removed. And I wrote a blog on this, so you can have a look at the slides for this presentation, or you can go and have a look at my blog. Um, so there's a lot of flags that were removed in JDK 9. And these are not too bad, because what happens is if you try and use any of these um, particular flags, all it will do is say, give you a warning saying this has been removed, so just be aware that it's no longer being um, processed in any way. Then we've got a whole set of deprecated JVM flags. So there were things that were used in JDK 8, which now have a different flag in JDK 9. So a lot of these are, as I say, related to things like garbage collection and tracing and so on, things like that, and the unified logging system. So where we used to do um, you know, trace bias locking, there's now minus x log colon bias locking equals info. So there's a whole set of things that have changed in terms of JDK 9. Now, depending on which of those options you've used, the JVM will treat them differently. So there are two forms of warning message. First is that uh, the JVM is nice, and it says, OK, yes, minus XX plus print GC is deprecated. I will use the alternative instead. So it just sets it to the correct one for you. The other one is where it's not quite so nice, and it says, OK, crash, create mini dump on crash with deprecated version 9 will likely be removed in a future release. Use option create core dump on crash instead. OK, right, so that's not too bad either. But then we get the, the non-starters. So I'm, I'm not going to bother um, like reading all these out to you. But like I say, there's a lot of these which are related to incremental concurrent mark sweep. There's a lot of them which are sort of um, printing stuff about garbage collection and stuff like that. But if you've used any of those, or any of those, I said this quite a lot, um, then what these will do is actually prevent your JVM from starting up. So what it'll do is it will say, unrecognized VM option, blah, um, could not create the Java virtual machine, and your application won't start up. So you will need to make some changes to your command line in order to get uh, that to start up. So there are 50 of those, 50 command line options, which will prevent your application from starting up in JDK 9. JDK 10. So that's, that's JDK 9. What is new in JDK 10 that will affect compatibility? Right, well, the first thing is local variable type inference. So now we have a var in Java. Var is now a reserved type. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that means that if you want to do var, var, you can. No problem with that. Var is not a reserved word. So anybody use var as a variable name? Yeah, come on. Please. Yes, I was going to say, we all do it, don't we? <laughs> So yes, yeah, so you can still do var var. That's that's no problem at all. However, var is a reserved type. So what you could have done in JDK 9 or JDK 8, you can't do in JDK 10, which means you can't create a class called var with a lowercase v. Now I'm sure nobody here would have done that because of course it should have been an uppercase v, and you can still do var with an uppercase v. But it does mean that should you have created a class in JDK 9 or earlier, which is called var with a lowercase v, you can't make that work in JDK 10. So that's the implication of the fact that var is now a reserve type in JDK 10. More things have been removed. So various deprecated things in earlier versions of 
Java have now been removed. So in, if you look at the com sun security auth package, and so probably the person who was using uh, things earlier on, he may also have problems here. So there are actually six classes that have been removed here. Uh, actually, it's probably not going to affect many people unless you're using Solaris and specific security things around Solaris. So there's um, various um, classes which are related to some of the um, security side of Solaris which have been removed. Um, then the security manager in java.lang, so this might be slightly more, um, have a slightly more of an impact. So one field has been removed, so the in check field has been removed, and then there are seven methods there that have also been removed, so class depth, class loader depth, current class loader, current clo loaded class, get in check, in class, in class loader. All of those things have disappeared, so if you've used those, you're going to have to change your code. Uh, one, a couple more things, uh, Java Lang runtime. There are two obsolete internationalization methods that have been removed, so get localized input stream and get localized output stream. Both of those have gone away as well. A uh, couple of miscellaneous things, so the Java H tool that's always been around for JNI, for creating the header files for that. Java H has gone away. If you have scripts that use Java H explicitly, you will need to change them to use Java C minus H. So that's the new way of doing things. And similarly, the policy tool has been removed. Minus XX command line flags. <laughs> I, I did a bit of research on this. In fact, I did this this morning. And there's been a massive cleanup of minus XX command line flags. And if you sort of trace the history of this, actually more and more of these have been added. And a JDK 9 had 869 command line flags. Can you imagine the fun you could have putting all of those on the command line for, for one particular JVM? So JDK 9 had 869. JDK 10 only has 537. So there are 366 flags which have been deleted between JDK 9 and JDK 10. Um, I had a look through them. I, I, I didn't bother putting them all on a slide because I thought that was going to be pretty pointless. Um, I will write a blog entry about this um, once I've done a bit more research on it. But essentially, 366 flags have gone away. There's a lot of um, print out this. There's a lot of um, uh, various other things that have been deleted and so on. There are also, um, I think there's about six of the minus X options that have also been deleted as well. Um, there's things like... Um, uh, being able to set the maximum stack size and, and things like that that have gone. So just to sort of conclude then, I've got a couple of minutes left, um, migrating to JDK 9 or JDK 10. Easiest way to start with, simply leave everything on the class path and run your application unchanged. So the only thing you need to really worry about is if you've used internal APIs, either directly or indirectly, if you've got specific JVM flags that are no longer supported in JDK 9 or JDK 10 versus JDK 8. Um, encapsulation, as I said, there's various command line options that you can use to get around that. So if you have used internal APIs, you need to use the appropriate command line option for that. Um, smaller changes can provide some issues. So if you've used like a single underscore, if you've used any of the deprecated APIs that have now finally been removed, then you will be needing to make some changes to your application to migrate it to JDK 9 or JDK 10. And similarly, flags as well. A um, few useful links. There's uh, one that Oracle have provided, uh, docs.oracle.com, Java SE 9 slash migrate. That has a, a lot of useful information in it. And then there's two blog entries that I've written there, which are um, sort of JDK 9 pitfalls for the unwary, which is a lot of um, what I've already talked about. And then there's extra command line options in JDK 9, so it talks about what the new ones are and also what the old ones are that have been removed. I'll be doing another one for JDK 10 shortly. Since I work for Azul, I will publicize the fact that we create a version of OpenJDK as a binary distribution that you can download for free. So what we do is we take the OpenJDK source code, we build that, run all the build scripts, generate the binaries, and then we run the TCK tests on that to ensure that it does pass all of the Java SE standard requirements. We have older versions available, so if you want older versions of Java and you need 
continued support for that. We've got JDK 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. When 11 comes out, obviously, we'll support that. And we have wider platform support available. We still support Windows and Linux on 32-bit. So if you've got some very old machines and you need support for that, we can do that. We also have support for ARM architecture, both 32 and 64-bit, and even PowerPC. As I say, you can go to our website. You can download these all for free. They're available under the GPL v2 with class path exception license. Um, so freely distribu distributable. And if you do want commercial support for that, we will be very happy to talk to you about it at a very reasonable price. So with that, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. I guess I have a couple of minutes, so if anybody does have any questions, I can... Um, so, so well, the, the, <laughs> yes. So, so there is a new JDK every six months, and as I, I explained in my presentation yesterday, the issue that you're going to have to face is that the public updates are only going to be available for six months until the next release of the JDK comes out. So, if you want to continue using Java for free, then you will have to update your JDK every six months. So, that is the biggest. Um, change. And because of the fact that there are a lot of things changing in terms of removing features as well as adding features, that could potentially be something which requires work each time you need to move to a new version of the JDK. So it, it is something that um, you should definitely consider when looking at how you're going to deploy Java in the future. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs>